Hi guys, uh, we, we have uh, some people live and, and who are listening to us right now. Uh, just wanted to introduce ourselves again. Uh, my name is Jonathan. I'm just uh, not part of the Ambrosis team. I'm here to uh, help to put this together. Uh, also, I help to collect some questions so you guys can ask some questions. Uh, but I think it's uh, what, what we'll be hearing from Angel, uh, he's the CEO of the Ambrosis project, also is to give us a, a quick introduction to the project as well. So. Um, Maybe Angel, you could start with that uh, at the beginning right now, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, so Ambrosus is a platform that assures quality, safety, and origins of products. Our two main industries we focus on are food and pharmaceuticals, although the protocol itself is a general purpose protocol. So it can be used for a variety of other industries, and the more people actually develop use cases for it, the more uh, applications there will be. Besides the protocol itself, we also develop solutions to integrate sensors into the blockchain, as well as creating a variety of different applications, distributed applications, open source that any stakeholders in the supply chains can use. All right. Okay, cool. So I, I thought there was a, a pause there. So it looked no, like. I thought it's a 10 second delay, so I was waiting. Anyway, yeah, <laughs> that's it. I tried to be laconic with my presentations. So yeah, so um, that is what Ambrosis Project is all about. Uh, I think there are some people, some viewers who actually um, don't really know uh, what uh, much else about the project. Um, is there anything else you could share with us, perhaps about, uh, say, maybe how you actually came about, uh, how you actually started the project? Uh, you know, what brought you to this stage? Uh, maybe a little bit more about the journey that the team has taken thus far. Yes, so in the past I used to work at the United Nations and uh, I was working on the, uh, in different departments and trade and investment division in the Department of Technology and Innovation and then a few others, many of whom were applying modern technologies or emerging technologies to solve the big issues of tomorrow. And I just looked at what issues were the most pressing ones and for which issues there haven't been any solutions. And one of them was really uh, life essential products, food, and pharmaceuticals, especially the problem of uh, not having uh, enough quality control or assurance for populations in many parts of the world of what it is that they're consuming. So from that perspective, we actually looked at what solutions could there be to improve the global supply chains for food and pharmaceuticals and to align them with the interests of the sustainable development goals. And um, uh, we actually discovered that uh, I started looking at what technologies you could use to solve these problems. I looked at AI, I looked at some other fields. And then of course, when we discovered blockchain, we, this was back in 2014, more or less, I immediately saw the transforming potential of this technology for the supply chains. Mm -hmm. And uh, we actually started kind of discussing within the UN and with, others, with other stakeholders, uh, how we could apply this, um, you know, merge kind of blockchain to solve the problems of the food because the food tech as an area of innovation is really, I mean, it's not that old because for a long time there were a lot of startups trying to solve various problems but uh, not in the area of food that really only took off in the last two, three years. And um, this is how we came to the idea of why don't we actually create uh, a blockchain solution to assure quality, safety and origins of food and of other live essential products. I first presented the vision for uh, sustainable supply chains and uh, resource management at uh, Vatican Youth Summit, where I presented actually um, at the um, Pontifical Academy of Arts and Sciences, and it was personally attended by the Pope, uh, by the Pope Francis. So it was, uh, and a few other top stakeholders as well in the global governance. And uh, this uh, project proposal received a very uh, big response. And then it became a bit of a snowball effect. We have the United Nations, who are now our, uh, we're an official partner to the United Nations 10 YFP program. The Swiss authority has started supporting this project and then a few top stakeholders on the blockchain world uh, joined and then uh, after we created the first prototypes and proof of concept, we decided to reach out to some stakeholders who can help us actually turn this protocol into, an, into a full-fledged open source ecosystem. And this was the point where I reached out to, to Gavin Wood uh, and actually pitched the idea to him and uh, there was a tremendous response from them because actually these guys said, you know, this is a meaningful mission and uh, Parity will be very happy to support that part. So we also improved our core, actually in terms of the ability to deliver on the smart contracts and on the protocols. And then uh, over time, we actually came to where we are right now. 
that's uh, actually a very exciting journey so far. You know, um, I, I'm sure there's so much work that you guys uh, are excited to do. Uh, I have seen the roadmap that you guys are looking at. So, um, for the benefit of the viewers here, uh, could you share with us a little bit more about, you know, um, say some of the key areas, the key points, uh, checkpoints rather, in your roadmap that uh, your team, uh, you and your team are targeting, uh, say perhaps for the next three to five years? Yeah, well, what can I add besides the uh, detailed overview on the website? Do you want me to comment on something or hmm. what should I give besides what we already have? Maybe you let me just say something that's uh, uh, one thing that will be very uh, a bit more specific. So, by which year uh, would you uh, actually aim to see us being able to uh, look at having uh, where we are able to go to a supermarket and actually verify uh, the supply chain and, and, and where this food, uh, where this, uh, say, this salmon uh, came from. When do you foresee something like that uh, to happen? Yeah. Uh, this particular application, we're already using that actually. So this is not something that is, uh, you know, a uh, long term future solution that already exists. The question is rather on the operations. How do you integrate that in a way that makes economic sense? So technologically, we've achieved that. We've, I mean, we've actually, uh, you also have a video on YouTube where you can actually see the whole process with the Argentinian steak. This was done during one of our uh, pilot projects. Uh, right now, we work with uh, some companies also to showcase that with other products. But the basic uh, question is whether the consumers uh, actually Oh, there is less light suddenly. Uh, could we leave this on, or is it, uh, or is it consuming energy or something? Oh, oh. well, because right now my face is dark, as if I'm. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, yes. No, we have uh, we have a two screen. We have uh, uh, the Swiss national TV here, so they are kind of at the same time. Anyway, uh, the point is that the, this we already do, so we have the, the capacity to place the uh, QR code or an NFC sticker on a product, and then you can actually tap your phone or use any other device and see the full history. Uh, the question is, right now, the process is inefficient. So it's uh, about making that scalable and economic, and for it to make economic sense. So what our goal is, is by Q1 2018, so January, February next year, which is basically three months, to have that uh, available on high quality or high price products, because that's the one that makes uh, more economic sense at the initial stages. So right now we've, uh, we've done a testing with the olive oil and with uh, some wine producers. So most likely one of these two products will be available already uh, in early 2018 for people to see the benefit of how that works. And then our goal in parallel is to make that, you know, actually scalable so that you have uh, actually basic products, uh, you know, baby food or any other uh, edible project or products or low price medicine to also have the same quality of, of um, quality assurance techniques. So for mass scaling, our goal is to have that within maybe nine to 12 months so that it's actually using multiple supply chains and not necessarily for expensive products. And also, uh, by that time, we hope that the uh, blockchain ecosystem uh, will actually evolve to the stage where you will be able to have uh, thousands of sensor readings being recorded in parallel in a cost-efficient manner. Because right now, that's not really possible. Not with our blockchain, not with anybody else's blockchain, um, especially if you want that to make uh, public. You know, if you make a permission blockchain, there are some solutions that exist. I've met some people who propose a partnership with us for a permission blockchain that can record this number of transactions, but this is not our goal. This is, we don't want to make a, basically a privately distributed database because that kills the purpose of what we do. So uh, the main challenges are not, I mean, the idea itself it works. It, it's the idea, the question is making that scalable and efficient. So what you're trying to do is something that's uh, really ambitious. Uh, I think one, question that comes to mind is, uh, it, it might be a, a strange question, but name Ambrosis, could you share with me a, a little bit more about how you guys came up with that name uh, for the project and what, what it means? Sorry, once again, I didn't get how we came to the name. Uh, Ambrosis, is there some uh, a specific meaning behind the name? 
Yes, uh, there is a meaning actually. If you look at our white paper, um, you will see that it begins with a quote actually by Ptolemy um, about the man seeking for the stars. And uh, Ambrosius comes from obviously the ancient Greek word ambrosia. Uh, ambrosia itself, uh, it's an ancient Greek word that actually um, served to describe a nectar of the gods. Um, and uh, the gods um, consumed it to get immortality, strength, and stamina. So uh, from this perspective, this is because we're dealing with life essential products such as food and medicine, both of which affect our life, well-being, and health, uh, we decided to use that particular name to, uh, to put it in the company to signify that what we're doing is also contributing to the health and well-being of people, and that's our core objective to assure that. Mm. Very and then we played around with the name a bit so that it's not Ambrosia. We changed it a bit to make it more unique. Um, and uh, that's how Ambrosius came around, yes. All right, cool. So I think the next part, which would be uh, very interesting to some of us and, and uh, would be related to how your project is being funded. What you guys are trying to do is really ambitious. Uh, and I would really like to see it happen, I'm, as I'm sure a lot of your other partners are looking at right now. So could you um, maybe, uh, maybe, Share with us a little bit about how this is being funded right now. Um, well, the initial stages of the funding, they came from uh, various sources. We've received support from the Swiss local authorities, uh, public sector stakeholders, so the government of the canton of Vaux provided some initial inputs for the financing. Uh, the rest of it was actually financed by the team and the partners are, uh, themselves. So it's, it's been a, basically a bootstrap solution. Uh, a lot of people joined in. Uh, they had... Uh, manage previous projects or we have quite a few stakeholders who ran uh, senior executive positions in large companies. So financing was not an issue uh, for the initial stages. So this has uh, basically been a mix of kind of public sector money with uh, private uh, support of people who are on board. And then right now, of course, we've uh, launched the uh, TGE itself, the token generation event. And this is serving to actually secure us financing for uh, execution for the next three years. For the next three years already? So yes, so the roadmap is going until uh, autumn 2020. So basically, from the TG point of uh, autumn 2017, you've got um, until autumn 2020. Because the um, the thing is with uh, supply chains, a lot of people expect this stuff to be ready like uh, snap of a finger, mm -hmm. and it doesn't work like that in the supply. The supply chains are a very archaic, outdated, sometimes uh, technology deficient uh, sector. So a lot of the uh, actual pilots that we're running, something that we thought would take us a month or two, takes a few months and then nothing works and you have to improve the process continuously. So and that's why there's also, there's been a number of companies who tried to tackle the supply chain problems in the past, three or five years ago, and they actually ended up nowhere. So this is why we also brought people who've had experience in other projects. So for example, on the side of parity, also we have a uh, Dr. Jutta Steiner, who is uh, supporting us through Parity, and she was a co-founder of Provenance, and then a few other people, uh, Oliver Busman, he used to be the chief information officer at SAP, which is used in a lot of supply chain management software. So from that perspective, we brought in people who have top-of-the-notch experience to solve this big problem, but even with all that, it will take time for this solution to emerge. It's not, of course, the case that you have to wait for three years to see this work, because we're taking a modular approach where, you know, every time, at the moment the module is deployed and released, you can have a certain functionality, if you will, it's a bit more than an MVP. Uh, so a certain app or a certain feature of the protocol that companies can start using immediately. And then, of course, in parallel, we're building other blocks. And in the end, after one year, we already want to have a very well-functioning ecosystem but some of the processes might be either manual or not really decentralized, so they'll have certain centralized components. For example, the data storage, that's still a big question of how you store large amounts of data from sensors. And currently, the solutions we have are, well, to use a nice word, hybrid solutions, and to use a not nice word, that means the centralized solutions are present there as well, because there is currently no real decentralized solution to store things, even with uh, some projects who, who claim to be able to do that, we've tested them all. Um, well, it's not at the industrial level yet. And we, when we work with companies, they want something that works or they want uh, us to build for them something that will serve their needs. And this, is, this has been the point of investigations with a lot of companies we interact with is what solution makes sense 
And the point is that what makes sense for most companies is something like, okay, we give you the specifications, you build as a private blockchain. And then we have to tell them, well, we're not building private blockchains, we're building a public repository of information that we want the competitors, competing companies to use. And then, of course, uh, the question becomes more challenging in terms of, okay, but how do you do a public repository where the information is both available and uh, also verifiable and also low cost. And that's, that's the major question that we're tackling right now. Right. Cool. So, you know, um, I've, from what I understand, uh, the amount that has been raised thus far, uh, including the pre-sale. Um, before I go there, I just wanted to make sure the viewers understand what TGE stands for. A TGE is a token generation event. Uh, so, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, what that means is that it's actually a, uh, sort of like a funding uh, period where uh, any contribution to this project uh, will result in tokens uh, being distributed to uh, people who are funding this project, right? So, uh, I, I was, will this 30 million uh, be enough to uh, execute the business plan uh, for the next three years uh, that you were mentioning earlier on? Yes, so this question, of course, was a concern for people, and I addressed it in a blog uh, about a week ago, I think, mm -hmm. uh, stating that uh, it doesn't affect uh, the deliverables, and I actually gave the reasonings for how we would do it, and the most basic thing is the team and advisors still have a lot of tokens that remain with them, and the partners as well, and this was one of the purposes that uh, if one or two years down the road we realize actually this financing is running out and it's not uh, enough to execute the project, we, will, we can have access to additional financing where we can either sell tokens uh, to possibly, I, I, my expectation is that in two years, mm. Tokens will be just a basic thing that any venture capital fund can buy. Mm. Nowadays, there are very few venture capital funds that have the legal structure to purchase tokens. So there are only specialized hedge funds who buy cryptocurrencies or something. But actually, for tokens themselves, especially in Europe, 90% uh, of VCs I talk to, they say we're very interested, but we don't have the legal structure to participate in that. I'm very sure that in, in one or two years, the story will be different. They will upgrade their legal framework. So we would be able to uh, actually uh, get more financing by uh, the team or advisors uh, getting their tokens out. And the second part would be also if we actually bring up the value of the ecosystem, that is also another pathway to making financing self-sustainable. So we are pretty confident that uh, despite the difficulties that we've, uh, we've had, uh, we will be successful and actually a big part of the difficulties we're facing is because of the KYC process. So as, as we wrote, uh, we rejected tens of millions, like I think the total amount was, is now over $30 million that we rejected. So if we didn't do the KYC, we would have had 60 million, maybe even more now. Um, uh, but uh, for, you know, I'm not commenting whether it's good or bad, uh, but um, there is definitely, uh, I observed it firsthand, there is a lot of uh, dirty stuff going on in the whole of ICO fundraising process. And I'm quite proud to say that in our company, there is not a single dollar that comes from, you know, suspicious sources or anything related with, you know, terrorism, drugs, or some other unwanted things. So, and this has resulted in quite a few partners, both in the financial sector, as well as in the Crypto Valley, who are supporting us, because uh, Oliver Boosman is the president of Crypto Valley, and quite a few other people who are prominent stakeholders in the ecosystem. They say, we support your project because you change the direction. You actually bring legitimacy to the ICOs because we started doing that before there were regulations telling us to do that. Uh, when I started looking in summer at the process, I said, this party will not last long. And by the time we have our TGE, it will be too late. So when we first started, a lot of people said, oh, you, you're stupid. You're losing millions of dollars. I say, look, do I want to lose millions of dollars? Probably not. So if, if I'm doing something that has to make some sense, and right now, actually, just you know, a couple of weeks ago in Switzerland, the FINMA, the financial watchdog, they've issued the clear uh, direct directives on how they treat the uh, TGEs and ICOs in Switzerland, and it's very clear that those who have not conducted the proper KYC procedures will be in trouble. So right now, I should say, oh, well, now it makes sense, but, you know, people really like to criticize a lot louder than actually recognize that, you know, you did something right. And that's fine for us. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that we actually are able to use this money to interact with legitimate stakeholders, to enter meaningful partnerships with those parties who don't necessarily have the ability to accept cryptocurrencies, and that is the case with most stakeholders. 
So you do have, on the one hand, a very big craze with everybody talking, everybody talking about Bitcoin and Ether, but actually in our business operations, many stakeholders, even those I will not name them, but some of the people who you know are their their name is synonymous with blockchain. I tell them, can I pay you in Ether? They say, ah, yeah, give us fiat. You know, so mm-hmm. there is a bit of hypocrisy, hypocrisy there. So therefore, I have to make sure that the money is clean, and when I come to a Swiss bank, they won't, they won't tell me, like, oh, do you have uh, money of, you know, some suspicious people? Because we can tell them, well, no, actually, we're fully compliant. So uh, that, that creates a longer-term sustainability for our project, actually. Okay. Okay. So, so let me just let try me just again. Try again. Uh, is this, is much, this much better now? Better now? Yeah. Yes, now, now it's much better. better. Yes, yes, now it's better, yes. Okay, so uh, I will, so something I want to ask you is that uh, you guys have been running the uh, funding in a very speedy, speedy manner, and uh, there has been some speculation that there is a plan to uh, in the usual way. In the usual way, companies are funding your project right now. Project right now, right? So, right. so is that actually is that uh, actually uh, part of your uh, plan to actually go plan and to actually go and IPO? Um, is it more is it related more to what you were sharing earlier about five years time, time, uh, in, a uh, where in a situation where you guys are in a situation where you guys are in a situation where you guys are in a situation where you can actually go out there and these will be a lot more 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 that's one of the possibilities so we did have discussions at one point uh, one of our partners has proposed uh, to list us on a European stock market exchange through an IPO and well, that discussion is still ongoing. The point is, for us, the question is, do we need to do it uh, at, at an early stage or not? Because the discussion is basically, uh, that, that's a rumor, but the rumor is basically saying that, uh, well, actually, it's more than a rumor. There, these are talks I've heard from some people who are uh, insiders on uh, a few stock market exchanges, that they're gonna list companies, and you know, when you list a company for an IPO, you must obviously uh, give a full disclosure of what is owned and, and so on and so on. And uh, amongst other things, tokens themselves can be considered such an asset. I mean, that's the discussion going on right now. And of course, if any company IPOs with tokens being an asset, then that substantially increases the, the valuation. Uh, however, I'm not entirely sure if we're going to go that way or not, because uh, most of the IP, like the blockchain protocol we create, it's, it's open source. So it's, uh, it's not owned by the company. As soon as the code is out there, we release it on the GitHub. Anybody, anybody is free to copy it and release it. The same thing is what we're working with Parity. With Parity, uh, everything that we're creating together is licensed by MIT, open, open source license. So once again, anybody can use it for their own purposes. And uh, basically, it's not straightforward whether the classical reasoning of IPOs will apply because most of the valuable, so to say, IPO, well, IP, sorry, intellectual property, will be in the open source domain. And therefore, it will not really fit as a, as a valuable asset of the company per se, which is one of the requirements for the IPO. So uh, the discussions are ongoing. I think I've read some people post ridiculous things like we're going to get listed on New York Stock Exchange or something. That, I mean, maybe one day, but that's, that's uh, we don't have any plan. I mean, we're not even accepting money from Americans. Like, why would we get, well, actually, that's a smart way to actually, that you get listed on New York, then you can accept money from Americans. But we're not, we've never actually said anywhere we're going to do a uh, New York Stock Exchange listing. I've read it on, on our chats, and I just, uh, well, some of these people clearly were uh, trolls because uh, our admins said they all come from the same IP address, et cetera, et cetera. But there's been quite, quite a few things that are a bit weird. Mm-hmm. Uh, but overall, this is something that is one of our considerations at the moment. And why we're interested in that, amongst other things, is the uh, potential, um, potential impact it could make on the uh, value of, of some parts of our blockchain. Because right now, uh, you know, as I said, venture capital funds cannot buy into uh, cannot buy into tokens, and of course, when you're talking about bigger institutional investors such as pension funds or big institutional investors or banks, they're even one step further from that. Uh, so, in Switzerland, for example, just uh, I think early this year, pension funds were finally allowed to put 0.5 percent of their total funding into venture capital. So it took them all this time to just arrive to the point that they finally permitted the uh, pension funds to 
participate in VC funding and put a small portion of that. But right now, VC is itself like some people say it's going to die in one year because so ICOs are replacing them already. So um, I mean, it's going to evolve. It's going to. I already see some boutiques emerging that kind of specialize in ICOs. So they'll just evolve. But the the point of all this is that um, you know the financial industry, because of the regulations and and uh, all the friction, it takes them a long time to come to a consensus and say, okay, fine, we're going to accept this. And by the time they accept something, the, the world has moved on already, and the technology especially. So from that perspective. Uh, of course, the benefit of having such, a, uh, such an offering would be that institutional investors such as pension funds could buy into Amber, which of course would be very, very interesting for us and we are exploring this actively. And uh, people, of course, should not assume that if we explore something, that's a promise. I mean, it, it would be great because uh, if people want the basic reasoning, it, benefit, it would benefit a lot ourselves as well. So we're a rational agent, and a rational agent wants to, you know, increase their wealth or something like that. But uh, we also have to look at the legal implications of this and so on, and to see if that makes sense from a strategic point of view. And because, as I said, the overall ecosystem and the blockchain is open source, that might or might not be the best way to proceed forward. So we will see about that, uh, I guess, in, in uh, one. I think in one or two months, we'll be able to give, a, you know, more... Because the plan, like one of our partners proposed to do that as early as next spring, uh, which to me it sounds highly unlikely, and it's not even the goal. I mean, our company doesn't exist to continuously raise money, so um, I think uh, it doesn't make much sense. Uh, but if we see that can benefit the ecosystem and token holders as well, because we do uh, also, you know, care about uh, what token holders. How do I put this correctly? We are aware of the concerns that people have with us being silent on the exchanges and so on. And there are reasons. Just just as we had reasons with KYC, when everybody told us you're, you're silly with your KYC, we also have reasons with exchanges. So um, people, of course, usually want like a clear promise, like any other, you know, I, you look at any ICO, like we're going to get listed on Bittrex, Kraken, wherever. Um, we're not making any such promises. What we are saying is that you have to look at our people. You have to look at Jaron Lukasevich, who was the CEO of Coinsetter, which he sold to Kraken for a pretty substantial amount of money, which was publicly uh, you know, uh, reported. So you can make your own connection with Kraken there. We have uh, Jihan Chu, based in Hong Kong, who is the uh, chairman of the Bitcoin Association and founder of Ethereum community in Hong Kong and also having some connections to Hong Kong-based exchanges. And then we have David Drake, who has a financial stake in several cryptocurrency hedge funds, as well as uh, financial stake in a few exchanges. You can also make your own link there. So what I'm trying to say is that people who just you know, look at what we have, they can see the outcome, but we have certain legal limitations in what we can publicly promise, but people can make two plus two themselves. Or, yes. well, so, yes. we got so, some what are some of the best what practices, some of the best practices uh, does for uh, products? Some of the best practices for software engineering. Yes. Yes. That we're employing. Is that something that, that, uh, something that uh, uh, we're aware of? Or is aware of or is that something? Did you understand what you said? I understand, but um, I, I didn't quite comprehend the question. Maybe, what are the best? Maybe it is a bit of a it is a bit of a software engineering side of it's it's i understand it's a technical question but before i run away from it i need to understand what the question is because i don't actually you said what the, what are the best practices of software engineering that we're applying from brosus was that the question or yes that's right yes that's right yes um, overall, uh, I could actually, uh, maybe could call Vlad. Uh, I'll call Vlad Trifa, who is now our chief product officer, and mm. he'll be able to give you a few things on, on that, um, so that I don't just give you a nonsense answer for this. Um, yeah, before that, maybe... He'll, he'll, be, he'll, he'll be here in, in a few seconds, so in the meantime, I can answer one more question, maybe? Oh, yeah, so Vlad, Vlad is here. Um, Vlad, uh, the question is, it's we're live connected right now with an AMA, ask me anything, uh, and... So we have uh, Vlad, uh, Dr. Hi, Vlad Rifa here. Um, so the question they have is, what are the best practices of software engineering that we're applying for Ambrosus? 
Well, uh, that's, a, that's a good uh, question, <laughs> right, of the chef. But I think, you know, I would say uh, most of the stuff you've seen uh, today is startups, you know, like for me, continuous integration, continuous deployment would be the first thing that we definitely uh, are looking for. Lots of things uh, still need to be built right where we're beginning, but lots of the things will, uh, will take care in ways in how we develop. All our content is on GitHub for now. Most of our online platforms that we have are being automatically uh, deployed. So that's one of the things we want to obviously create a much, much stronger base around that and, and get anyone in the engineering team apply those. Uh, and then, you know, uh, in terms of software development, we're really looking and we give space to engineers to, to explore new technologies. So we're not uh, uh, fixed to one specific language or one type of framework just because. We're really, because we're building something quite new that hasn't been done before, so we can just take tools off the shelves and provide languages as they are and hope they would work. So we give lots of room as well to engineers to, to play around with that. Um, so I don't know if that answers, but... Sorry, uh, I just want to ask testing. Uh, when it comes to testing, uh, when it comes to testing. Uh, yeah, obviously we, we do lots of testing, so uh, that's clear the thing we'll be putting in place uh, very quickly, have automated tests. Uh, uh, for now, coverage could be better, I would say, but I think uh, a lot of the stuff uh, will definitely be tested. I mean, that's one of the ways, uh, you know, you, you need to... to that's one of the things you need to put in place if you want to have a continuous integration, right? So uh, for now, we, we have a copy of all our infrastructure and all our sites. Uh, for, we have a staging version uh, for all of that, and we test things there before we deploy them live, obviously. Um, but there's a lot there's a lot more things we will be doing very, very quickly. So you know, as, right. as our engineering team grows and, and we get more and more people on board, that's something we definitely want to want to keep evolving uh, over time. There are always new things appearing, new, new ways of, uh, of doing that. So, a lot to, to put in place, of course. Fantastic. Thank Fantastic. you so much. Thank you so much. Sure. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. <laughs> well, it was very uh, unexpected, but it's. Uh, <laughs> it's so he didn't know. He didn't know we would just invite him and just throw that question to him. So you saw him. He was in a, he was in a meeting next door, and then. Kate comes, I ah, must rescue the interview. So, yeah. And just, so you, we battle, battle tested our team members in. Uh, <laughs> just wanted to test the things that you need to be doing. To be doing. Yeah, you wanted to test us on what we're testing, is <laughs> Sure thing. No, but I think you know it's it, there's there's so much to to, to be done uh, and, and and learning that space, and it's just so exciting how how today you develop software, and I think that's quite different from the ways many companies in the market we are are doing things. They have a very different release cycles and and software development life cycles that last two years. They are building things that will go live in one two years down. Uh, that's obviously not not working, and, and, and for us, we really want to shorten the development life cycle of things. And we are, yeah, we we are building some stuff that we want to release in one two weeks from now, uh, and you know that that just can be done with very long term, very static ways of building software. We just need to be very agile. And I think we release a lot of our stuff already, even the TDU website, and so on. We release updates and changes several times a day. To some of those things, so cool, cool. But yeah, he needs to be done now. Cool. So, I'm, 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 I'm yeah, go back to the guys. Yeah, thank you very much, Vlad. Yes, thank he you. He goes back for next door. Sure, so, thank you. Something else comes. See you guys. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. What has Gavin Wood contributed to the project? Yes, yes, yeah. So overall, as I mentioned, when we got the critical mass and the initial, uh, we established the proof of concept, released the future, the initial product and so on, I realized that we do have a team of um, lead developers. So uh, Marek and Matthew and Conrad, they're team leads. Actually, we have uh, uh, a few more people working on the development side, but they're leaders, uh, they're, they're the team leads. And uh, they have their own teams, and they have also extensive kind of design experience and so on. But when we started tackling the problem, as I told you, we realized that actually in this space, uh, even the top stakeholders don't have a good answer to the scalability problem I described earlier. 
So what I realized is that we actually need somebody who is, you know, best in the world uh, to be able to solve that particular problem. And uh, it was, I mean, we had a, a few, we narrowed down the list to a few people, and one of them was Gavin. And of course, it's, uh, we met him uh, in Geneva. It was a one day long meeting where we just basically discussed, Ambrose described, discussed the vision and what we're trying to do. And uh, uh, the guy says, well, you know, actually, uh, uh, I think he said it took him like two weeks to code the first uh, proof of concept for Ethereum. So, uh, and then another two years to create, uh, another 18 months to create kind of a working, stable implementation of that. So, um, the guy has an amazing ability to, of course, uh, turn bold ideas into actually programmable and executable stuff. And he said, this thing you're trying to solve is extremely difficult. And uh, what he liked about this, I mean, I'm not speaking on his behalf here, but it's just what, what kind of the discussion was that he really liked that the... Uh, problem is a very fundamental problem uh, are, I mean, that's their own words that they're trying to solve the humanity's most important missions and they work on uh, questions of energy, they work on questions of, uh, you know, inter-blockchain operability and so on and uh, the future of food and life essential products, he actually said that that's an important question to solve and a difficult one. So they really like the challenge, you know, they, uh, they both, both Gavin personally and the rest of Parity, they like the fact that this solution can actually be transformative. And this is why uh, actually they decided to join. So uh, besides providing the technical, so they serve as our technical advisors, uh, the, the whole Parity team, uh, they helped us both on the conceptualization. So when we first came to the workshop with them in Berlin, uh, we basically had, we presented them the, the software that we've built, that our team has created the outline for the protocol and the architecture of the token of Amber, which is a data bond of the token. So uh, we spent the whole day with Parity, you know, brainstorming on how you actually make that work, uh, how you structure the data, where you store the data, and we looked at different solutions. We initially looked at Swarm, then we looked at IPFS and at a few other solutions. And um, Gavin and the rest of Parity, they've been very helpful in terms of actually, you know, answering the basic questions that would take us uh, ourselves a long time to solve. And, you know, of course, these guys know uh, a lot of useful things in the blockchain domain. And besides this, they are, of course, they have a library of the smart contracts. I mean, Parity, a lot of their stuff is also open source. But because uh, we told them from the beginning, our ICO, uh, our, our TGE, sorry, our token generation event needs to be, uh, you know, KYC compliant, and that requires, of course, certain amendments because we actually whitelist wallets of participants after they uh, they uh, they submit the KYC documentation and so on. So we needed certain functionality in our smart contracts, and uh, this is why the smart contract that we have for the TGE. It was uh, scripted by Parity and by Gavin. I mean, on GitHub, you can see the commits that Gavin has personally made. And uh, the, the co contract itself was a, an innovation. He wrote it from scratch. So it wasn't uh, a reuse. Like normally, ICO just reuse other existing smart contracts. In our case, Gavin and the rest of Parity, they wrote it from scratch. And then, of course, we had to run it through several uh, audits to make sure that there are no bugs or problems because, you know, when you have something new, you always have to test, stress test it. And this was also one of our key concerns, and which was the reason for the delay. We had a number of security issues. And again, some people were starting, like, started to criticize us, saying that, oh, you delay this stuff. Uh, the point is we don't have the alternative universe at our disposal. Because you see that uh, every week there are ICOs getting hacked. Most recently there was the Ether party, I think, with a really basic hack when hackers, you know, breach the website, replace the address for contribution, and then millions of dollars are gone. So um, we don't have the alternative universe where we would launch on the 13th and then we would have a hack and then $30 million or more would be stolen. So um, this is the same problem that actually many politicians face, you know. Many politicians, especially during the bad times, they get criticized, like, look at the country, it's in a mess, uh, we have an unemployment of like 6%. What people don't realize is that without this person, maybe the unemployment would have been 12%. It's just the external environment is very bad. And sometimes you're not trying to make things better, you're trying to make things less worse. So this is what we did with the security. We've had three phishing websites 
that were trying to collect money on behalf of Ambrosos using a completely 100% copy, a clone of our website. And our security team took these websites down. The live versions were taken down in 30 minutes each. There is no other TGE that got hacked and, well, or had a phishing website. They would take them down that fast. We had, I mean, two of them didn't collect anything. One of them had, uh, I think, five or six Ether in. And actually, nobody contacted, well, actually, no, two people contacted us. They said, oh, yeah, we were the ones who sent money. Or, like, oh, I lost my money. I said, okay, you, how much did you give in total? Three Ether. We will compensate them three Ether. Three Ether in, in this scale is nothing, really. But we managed to basically bring the losses down to nothing. And I think this is something we haven't, I mean, we kind of talked about this, but we didn't brag about it too much. But I think that's something that also needs to be appreciated is uh, we cannot prove it because there is no alternative universe, but this security approach has been, uh, you know, existed there for a purpose. And this is also something we've been doing jointly with Parity and with Gavin and the rest of the Parity team. It's important to stress that it's not just Gavin alone. It's, uh, the whole Parity team are helping us on the solution. And we have regular workshops with them. So uh, our next workshop is planned for November uh, in, in basically one month time where we're going to set up kind of the follow-up on the operations for Ambrosos protocol and Parity will specifically help us with finding the right technology stack for the pilot projects we're currently uh, conducting with companies and the ones that are currently on the proposal. So right now in the next door where Vlad has a meeting, we have uh, corporate uh, also clients from, uh, from a large company. We hope to make the partnership uh, being public as soon as possible. But of course, in this space, uh, most companies, when they interact with you, they usually want an NDA, the non-disclosure agreement, and so on. Uh, but importantly, we do have a lot of stuff going in the background. It's not ideal for the TGE. Of course, I'm well aware if we said, you know, uh, there are, well, I will point fingers in this case, actually. I'll point a finger at Monaco, you know, the, the cryptocurrency card. We said, oh, we're working on a deal with Visa, and the, their price went up by seven times. Uh, I usually don't point fingers, but I point finger at them because this, in my opinion, was highly unethical of what they did because they, they drove up the price of, the, of their token by seven times and then it turned out that, oh, well, Visa that partnership doesn't exist. And I really hope that there'll be less practices like this in the industry because I really hate that. Uh, these, uh, you know, situations like this, they make the whole industry look like a joke. And uh, then legitimate companies have a problem of, like, we need to run the show. I really don't want to run the show for the public. Uh, I want to actually work on our stuff. And uh, our team is working like 16 hours per day, sometimes more. Mm -hmm. Katerina sitting here, people talk with her at 4 a.m., 5 a.m., I don't know, any time. We are always there. And that's what we want, uh, you know, people to actually to, to realize that. I mean, of course, you know, cryptocurrencies is like a big part of it is all a PR. It's like a reality show. But what I want the industry to actually become is less of a PR show and more of an action. So from that perspective, we do want to, uh, you know, of course, to update people on the progress we made, and we will be releasing an activity report on, you know, on all the achievements we've had. We've been a finalist at the Hello Tomorrow Summit and a few other things that we've done. Uh, we probably should be better at communicating this stuff, but uh, our team is actually busy getting these, these things done, uh, and probably we should spend more time just talking about this. So, I'd just like to thank She did talk to me at 3 a.m., I think. I think. To set up this. To set up this. So, it's okay. I hope you get it. You, Angel. You, Angel. So, yeah. So, yeah. I think happening now is that I'm going to be eating my salad. I look forward to the day. day. look forward to the day. Um, where this food, um, where this food uh, actually came from. Uh, actually came from. <laughs> yes. In, in three years time. Three years time. Uh, I do hope that's earlier. Three times is actually when we have an ambition to make supply chains automatic with that real-time quality auditing. But the ability for people to have the basic information, trustworthy information. I mean, information you have it now in the packaging, but can you trust it? Well, a lot of evidence shows no. Uh, so the point is for us to bring in more transparency and uh, for that purpose with a salad or well salad is maybe that this particular product maybe will take a bit longer but some other products we definitely want to make this live already early next year all right perfect all right, thank, perfect. You. thank you so much for your time thank you so much for your time and Kate and Kate yes so yeah. so yeah yeah appreciate this as well and thanks so much for organizing this have a good rest of the have day a good rest of the day yes thank you Goodbye, guys. All right. Bye.